you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. We see a beautiful conversion of a man. Just like what we sang right now, it reminded me as we were singing uh, the previous song, Lord, you will take what the enemy means for evil and you will turn it Amen. for good. And I, I think of a, of a talented, incredible, zealous individual who um, was confused and didn't really understand, like all of us, you know, but by the grace of God, there we go. Amen. And we see this man, a beautiful conversion, uh, the, uh, the uh, conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the, the talented and bold missionary, the great missionary in the early church. Acts chapter 9, uh, for the sake of time, we're just going to read a few verses there, and we'll read a few others uh, and kind of summarize in this message the, the entire chapter. But Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, I'm reading from the New King James Version. This is the Damascus Road experience or conversion of, of Saul of Tarsus. Beginning in verse 1, Saul, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice, a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In verse 5, and we'll end here. And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And Father, again, we thank you so much, Lord, for your amazing grace and for this uh, account in history where you indeed took Someone, Lord, who was lost and confused, but yet so zealous and such a talented individual like Saul of Tarsus. And Lord, he came to that place of realizing who you are. And Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace. Give us ears to hear, I pray, and, and speak only what you have for your people this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we have Saul. Saul of Tarsus, who uh, many, if not all of you, and if you don't know, he is the, the individual who becomes the, the great apostle Paul. He is like a raging bull. And we see verse 1, it says that he's breathing threats of murder against the disciples. We know that from the very beginning, this is the same man who was guarding the coats of the people who executed Stephen, the first martyr in the church. And he has made every effort to crush the church. But as we just know, right? I love Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God. And ultimately for his good, for his glory, for his purpose. And now this individual, what an unbelievable, uh, beautiful conversion here. And in this message, I hope and pray for you and for me, that we would uh, survey, if you will, all that, that we know of in Acts chapter 9 of what a beautiful conversion is, what it looks like as we, as we look at the life of this man, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul. But now he, he is so zealous, he goes and he gets warrants of arrest from the high priest and Caiaphas at that time, the high priest. And he takes his anti-Christian campaign to Damascus. Anyone experience any anti-Christian uh, <laughs> anything in your life lately? You know, there's, you know what? There's nothing new. It, it started in the beginning, and guess what? Until the Lord returns, we, we, this will... Jesus said to his disciples, you, they hated me first. They're going to hate you. And so we know this is not our home. This is, I've said it once and many other times, we, we're sojourners. We're just pilgrims, just pa passing through. But this anti-Christian campaign of, of, of Saul of Tarsus, he takes him to Damascus, which is about 150, approximately 150 excuse me, miles uh, from Jerusalem, uh, outside of Jewish territory. 
And when I've had the privilege of going to Israel twice, um, one of the times, I, that was my, I wanted to see or get close or be at the place where this took place, where on that road to Damascus, you know, I want to be there. I want to, I want to see where did this happen? Because when you go to Israel, you can go to many places when they say for sure still, we believe this is the very, very precise spot when this happened. And I wanted to see this. And I remember going in the bus and we're on the road to Damascus. We're just trucking along. I'm so excited. I don't know if some of you are here who went to Israel. Do you remember? You, so it was this, I'm not sure which group it was, but we went. And we got to the very end, the border, uh, which is Syria. And, you know, and we had to stop there. And you can see the city, Syria is right, right there. That's what Damascus is in Syria, modern day Syria. And all we could do is just stop there and pray and worship and we can see. Even the UN was stationed there at that time. But maybe perhaps in the very place where we were standing, maybe that's where that light came and, and this happened, this incredible account, real uh, situation that happened in history of something that the enemy uh, was using for evil and God turned it around for good. And so we just stopped there. We couldn't go any further because of the border of Israel and the border of Syria. We can look, Syria, we can look into uh, the, the, uh, the city, which uh, is uh, modern day Damascus. And so we get there, but again, if about 150 miles outside of Jerusalem or from Jerusalem, this journey from there would have taken a couple of days. And even in the haste that Saul of Tarsus, you can imagine, he is breathing murderous threats. I mean, he just can't wait to get to arrest anyone of the way, which by the way, uh, that's what they were called, the believers. They weren't called Christians until uh, they came to Antioch and then they started knowing them as, as Christians. And so, so they get to this place, a two days journey approximately, and so uh, Saul of Tarsus is going in its haste to get there. And suddenly he is blinded by the light from, uh, light from heaven, the light of the glory of Christ. He's blinded. And for three days he didn't eat, he didn't, he didn't drink. And, um, you know, was he at that point maybe fasting? What? I can assure you, just imagine, can't wait to get to heaven so we can ask these questions. Paul, what were you, what were you thinking? At that and besides, before this point, what were you thinking? <laughs> this man was a edu highly educated man. He sat at the feet of the greatest educator in the early church, Gamaliel. But you know what? Now... He was going to sit at the feet of Jesus for the rest of his rest of his days, and that changed everything. Everything changed for him from that point. He was blinded by the light of the glory of Christ. He was thrown to the ground. Now Saul finds himself being questioned by a person that he knew in his heart. He knew in his mind that this person was dead. Think about that. When when when. When the voice, when he says, who are you, Lord? He still doesn't know. But when, when the voice answers, Saul, Saul, it is Jesus whom you persecute. He, he just, he is hearing the voice of a man who he, he thought was dead. And then he realized he's not dead. He's alive. Not only that, he, he's God. <laughs> he... I mean, he identifies himself, I am, I am Jesus whom you, and you remember how Saul was a scholar. He knew how God identified himself in Exodus way back, right? How did God identify himself to Moses? I am. And he hears this, everything changes in a moment for Saul, but yet, it took him a long time, and he, had, he has to rethink all these things. Re, you could, all, that, all that knowledge, all that intellect, everything. And, and he's just, you know, he's going through his mind and, and pondering all this. 
And now God's going to turn that around and he's going to use all that, all that knowledge, all that thinking, all, all, all his intellect to preach the good news. That's why Paul was a man who said, you know what? I, 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 in essence, I choose to know nothing <laughs> except Jesus Christ and him crucified because he knew that's, that was the one thing that changes everything. I mean, his whole goal was now to prove that, that Jesus is the Christ. In fact, I always quote this verse to you guys, and I will quote it for the rest of my days until I have breath. And 1 first, first John chapter 5, verse 1 says that whoever believes that, that Jesus is what? The, here it is on, on the board. What is, Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. There was a lady in, in our congregation years ago. Uh, and he, she shared the story how she went to a pastor and she was wondering, you know, God had done that work. God had began to stir her heart. And then she didn't know what, who she is or what she is. And I spoke to someone last week, actually, after the service, and maybe I'll share that with you in just a moment. But this lady wanted to know, you know, you know, here's, here's where I'm at. And the pastor began to tell him, would you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Yes. And you know why it's so important that Jesus is the son of God? Because Israel, the identity of Israel was as the, as the, as the, the firstborn or the son, the, the son of God. They're the chosen people. And specifically to David, David, King David and his descendants. These are the sons of God. Very specifically to the one descendant of David who is the Christ, the Messiah. But yet when, when Jesus came on, on on the scene, they did not accept him as such. And so here's a man who knew, he knew the Bible. And by the way, at that moment, the Bible was the Old Testament. <laughs> the, the, they didn't have the New Testament. The, it, the New Testament is being written before our eyes. And, and so here's, he sees the, the light of the glory of Christ. He down, uh, goes down to the ground. Uh, he finds himself being questioned again by that person, that very person, Jesus, who he, he thought was dead and he's not. It is Jesus, the Christ, whose followers he is persecuting. And that moment, every, it, just a, a turning point, a turning point in, in that life. And Saul realizes the many things that I've mentioned just the last few moments. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus lives. He's not dead. <laughs> he lives. He lives. I, I love when my wife tells me stories, and I experience it myself, but she told me a story. I'm probably going to get it all wrong, so if you, get it, you need the details, talk to her afterwards. But she was telling me about a time where she woke up, and uh, very loud, she heard just this knock in the middle of the night, and she wakes up, and then she goes back to sleep or something like that. She hears it again and realizes that it was the Lord. You know, I stand at the door and knock. And so it just cost her to spend some time in prayer, even in the middle of the night. That's a challenge. I mean, try that. Because sometimes when I wake up, I, just, I struggle so hard, just, I want to just go back to sleep. But, but Jesus is alive. He suffers with his church. And we sang this morning, the battle belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you or me. And you talk about a day in history, it, right in the beginning of the early church, which there's so many exciting things happening now you got the most zealous, most influential, the youngest, uh, the future, if you will, of, of the, 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 the church of Judaism, if you will. And this guy's powerful. And he goes to get warrants for arrest. And this is taking place. And I love how wonderful the sovereignty of God is and what happens, this, this incredible, beautiful conversion. And Saul of Tarsus, no doubt, realizes that Jesus not only lives, but he suffers. He suffers with, with his people. And he's compassionate and gracious. Don't you think that maybe Saul of Tarsus realized that he could have just zapped me. I'm waiting for a, a, a lightning bolt to just... And he didn't. He didn't. I, I love that, that about Saul and his obedience. Who are you, Lord? And even at that point, not realizing, I can assure you that I know he, he knew 
He, this is, this, this is, this is uh, the deity that I've been, uh, you know, uh, living for and learning about. And, but he doesn't realize that it is Jesus whom you are persecuting. And Jesus didn't say, you're persecuting my church. That's what he was doing. But he, all this just takes place in that moment. And some would say this is the, the greatest and, 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 uh, and most famous conversion in history. And that's why when I went to Israel, I wanted to go. I want to see, can, you know, tour guide, can you tell me, can you take me maybe to the place that you think? And so we went and he says, well, unfortunately, here's the, here, that's the city, but we can see it. This is the road that leads to Damascus and just awesome. But the church's fiercest enemy is about to become the most gifted, energetic champion uh, that the church has ever seen. And certainly in the early church uh, the, the greatest missionary, the Apostle Paul. And so Saul, the, the persecutor, now becomes the Apostle Paul. And you know, this is such a powerful, again, such a powerful account in Scripture that Luke, in the book of Acts, there's three times is recorded. Three times, and one of them is by, uh, by uh, Luke's uh, own words, Twice by the Apostle Paul, twice in the, in the, book, of, the book of Acts. And then just leads me to, to, uh, uh, to reflect on how important your testimony is, my testimony is, that even if you don't think you have a great testimony, guess what? If you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, if you uh, are a believer, if Christ is in you, you have an awesome testimony. And that testimony is the most powerful thing that God uses in, in someone's life when you speak to them. And so three times, three times, again, Luke once, and then by his own words, uh, Paul loved to tell his story, but not just to, to flatter himself. He said, I'm the chief of sinners, right? <laughs> I've heard that from many of you, and I agree. <laughs> Oftentimes, because I, I think of my own life. <laughs> but, but think about it. The proud, the proud inquisitor, this proud inquisitor, this just incredible gifted individual, he comes breathing murder and, you, and just pride that we all struggle with. Even if you're just a sweet, you know, beautiful young gal, you struggle with pride. All of us struggle with pride. All of us, we do. And certainly Saul of Tarsus was not, uh, you know, was, was not, you know, excluded from that. He struggled with that. But what happened here, God humbles him. He goes to the, the lowest point, if you will, in his life where he's uh, broken. I mean, he's blind. He's going there with, a, a, you know, arrest warrants, and, he, and this happens, and everything just comes to a halt. And this man who is so young and vibrant now, he can't, even, he can't even lead himself the rest of the way to the city. They take him by hand. And, you know, it just reminds me how humility is a beautiful thing. God says of, uh, on, only a couple things he hates in, 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 in the Bible. One of them is, is pride. He, humility, he loves. And it's, it's a reminder for you and I. And he is led by the hand into the city. God brings help, healing. <laughs> he fills him with the Holy Spirit. He's baptized. The Ananias, a, a man who God uses, who we don't know much about. But uh, uh, in a dream, God speaks to him and tells him about someone there in Damascus, a, a man named Judas, which is not the Judas that, that betrayed the Lord, of course, we know that. But it's a man named Judas, and he says, go to his house, the street called Straight. And it's, it's really interesting. I wish we had that picture. It's still there. That street, it was a major road in those days, and it's still there today. In fact, uh, uh, if you go on, uh, on uh, Google, you might find it. If not, uh, come to me. I'll show it to you. I wish we had had it, but we didn't have time to show it. But it's still there, that street called Straight. And it just reminds me, it just triggered a thought in my mind how God wants you, believer, me, to be in that straight and narrow, right? There's nothing we can do to be saved. It is his grace alone. Yes, see? <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus, right? But there's things that are not good for you as a Christian. There's things that are not good for me. It's funny how 
God says, go to the street called Straight. <laughs> I, I've, often, I've often said, you know, that uh, we are born, we're all born sinners. In case anyone doesn't think so or know that, a child dies, I believe with all my heart, because God is gracious, they go right to heaven. They go, but there's an age of accountability when you know you're born to worship God. You, you need to choose this day whom you will serve. God, God wants, doesn't want people uh, lukewarm. You're either cold or hot. <laughs> God loves you, but not, not lukewarm. You're cold or hot. You're either for me or you are against me. That's our God, and I love that about him. But, but he, he goes there, and, and um, now Ananias, a man who, and by the way, if you read the whole story, this, he's, you know, kind of going back and forth with the Lord. This man, I've heard of this man, Lord. Are you sure this is, this is the man who's really killing your people, Lord? <laughs> just go. And there's times when we, we just have to trust God. And so he goes and he's obedient. And now, you know, they, 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 they call each other brothers. You know, they're brothers in Christ. And, and Ananias, by the way, is the first to know uh, or to know uh, of God's call to, to Saul to be an apostle and a missionary. And what a privilege it, it, it is for this man, Ananias, to not only see him healed, right? Because the Bible says that literally like something like, like scales. <laughs> and, and, and you can imagine those three days and what he's going through. But he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he's baptized. And Saul has a complete turnabout, a, complete. And again, going back to what we just talked about. You know, I love Joshua, the leader of Israel when Moses died, that that's the first charge to, to, to God's people. It choose this day you're going to serve. As for me, for me and my house, I can't control. I can't control anybody else. So I try. <laughs> Doesn't work. You know, and we, we, we can try to control, and we can talk about, you know, some people say the man is the, is the head of the house, right? He's the, 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 the man. But the woman is the neck, some people say, and the neck can turn the head any which way, right? <laughs> right? So you can, can but, but I can't control who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, you know, it's not about being here or... A, a, a calling is a calling, and this man definitely had a calling. And I thank God for me. There's no greater joy in my life than to see that my children walk in truth. Okay. And that for my prayer is, uh, you know, that, that I see that uh, until I close my eyes here, that they are. And then I can, I can be at peace and then go. And I thank God. I thank God for the work that he has done. And just keep praying for your children. Never stop praying. Just believe the battle is not yours. It belongs to what? It belongs to the Lord. Right? Train up a child in the way they should go when they're old. <laughs> God, that's right. And I love the faithfulness of God. So there's a complete, complete uh, turnabout that, uh, that he experienced. And Paul himself, in the letters to Galatians, he, we know that he spends three years in Arabia. Uh, in Arabia, uh, the border of Arabia is, is quite near as well to Damascus. And Luke doesn't tell us too much, like verse 23, if you can uh, put it on the board uh, of this chapter, verse 23, Luke just mentions, you know, after many days. And after many days, we know it took three years, three years from, from this moment of this beautiful conversion before Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, ended up in Jerusalem, three years. And so... Um, Paul has time, and he needs time, and again, you know, rethinking everything. Can you imagine the thought? Stephen was right. Jesus is the Christ. He was there. Can you imagine the tears that he shed? The, the, just the, the, you know, I can just see him violently convulsing and, 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 and asking for forgiveness. God, forgive me. I was there. He was there holding the coats. And I can't think of the crucifixion, I can't, I, a horrible way to die, but stoning. Can you, you can just imagine the thoughts that are going through his mind, rethinking everything, all that he went through, all that he learned from Gamaliel, the great educator. 
But now he sits at the feet of the one who created Gamaliel, <laughs> the one who created Saul, the one who created and spoke the, the universe into existence, the Lord Jesus. Now, now he, is, he is God's missionary in the true sense of the word. And I've said this before, that we can be sincere. And I, I believe that Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus was very sincere in what he was doing. But was he right? <laughs> he was sincerely wrong. But God did the work that he needed to do and wanted to do in his life. And so now the scriptures, now Saul of Tarsus realizes that the scriptures, all the scriptures point to Jesus. And again, at, at that moment, when I say the scriptures, I'm talking about the Old Testament because they didn't have the new. He realizes that the, that the, the scriptures, the Old Testament, everything pointed to Jesus. He realizes that. He realizes that the death of Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world, that the church is the body of Christ, and the way to peace with God is not by keeping his law, but by receiving his grace. This is, this is what he realizes. And also that God's people are not exclusively the Jews, but the worldwide company of believers, Christians. That's the church, both Jews and Gentiles. This is what, what the you know, rethinking process and what, what Saul is going through. And then um, when the time comes to, uh, to leave Damascus, I mean, the hostility was such, such against uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus. And you know what? <laughs> he was dishing out hostility just not too long from that. But you know what happens? The hostility was so great, they wanted to kill him. If they get his, their hands on him. They lowered him in a, in a in laundry basket <laughs> so that he could get away. For, unbelievable. But this is, so immediately, he, he knows the very thing that he was arresting Christians and, and, and the, the persecution that he was bringing against, that he even killed these, these believers. Now he is coming his way, but he knows. What did Paul say in, in, his, uh, in his writings, other writings other than Acts? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's even better. For me to die is even better. He realized that. You know, someone, I was talking to someone about that, and, and I think someone, forget who it was, they said, if you ask people, raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. All the hands go up. Yes, I'll, okay, keep your hand up if you want to go to heaven now. <laughs> I, why, why not? I want to go to heaven now. I want to go to heaven. Seriously. But it's true. <laughs> but, but, so, but, and then, you know, he gets back to Jerusalem again three years by the time he gets there. And, and the, when he gets by the time, read, read this account on your own. I know we're kind of going, kind of going through it uh, rather quickly. But he gets to, to Jerusalem. It takes three years for him to get there. And when he gets there, people are terrified of him. They don't even believe he's a, he's a Christian. You know, this ought to encourage us because there's one, one guy, Barnabas, who stands up for him and vouches for him. How beautiful is that, Barnabas? And you know, I was thinking about this, that oftentimes I bring condemnation to myself. You know, my thoughts, you're not, you're not, you're a phony. You're, you're this, you're that. You know that the Spirit of God, listen to this, Christian. How do you know you're a believer? The Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. You can say, yeah, but I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Son of God. I believe he's the Messiah. I believe he's the only way to heaven because all that is true. But he, the Spirit, he, not it, he, it is a person, the person of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, that I'm a child of God. That should encourage us. So when Paul gets to Jerusalem, you could imagine the discouragement. They were still terrified of him, and they didn't even believe. I don't know. I don't know. And Barnabas, praise God for Barnabas, because he said, no, I've seen him preach powerfully in the name of Jesus. I've seen it. I know it's been a short time. Please don't. And the very men that left Jerusalem with, with uh, you know, uh, warrants for arrest, he comes back. He has the boldness to go back 
Don't you think that Saul of Tarsus knew that his life could end like very quickly? But you know what? That's redeeming the time. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So what if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're in perfect shape and you're, you look great, beautiful? You're, you're, hard, you're one heartbeat away, as I say, one heartbeat away from standing before your creator. And Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, he knew that. But he gets to uh, Jerusalem, and just imagine, he would, no one, they were terrified, they didn't believe him, and Barnabas vouches for, for Saul of Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul. Barnabas, think about this, this is some food for thought for all of us. Barnabas always believes the best about people. That should speak to you and I. Because you know, every person you see, no matter what, no matter if, if they're breathing threats of murder, is there a lot of that going on right now? <laughs> right? You have to remember, those the people created by the living God. They just don't, they have the, the, the you know, they're, they're blind. In fact, the Bible says they're dead in their sins and trespasses. Like I was dead in my sins and trespasses before Christ. I've been made alive. Thank God I can see clearly. I don't know everything, neither do you, but I know one who does. <laughs> Amen? And so Barnabas always believes the best about people. If you have um, uh, chapter 15, 37 through 39 very quickly, look at here. Uh, there, I mean, there's a situation where the Apostle Paul and Barnabas dispute sharply, so sharply that they part ways. And you know what Barnabas does? Barnabas was determined to take, they were, they were um, uh, arguing about John Mark because Saul, Paul, Paul the Apostle was so zealous and this guy was just, man, a, a ball of energy, just all with like, you know, with blinders. That, and he wasn't happy with John Mark. Paul insisted that they should not take, <laughs> take uh, with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And then uh, the contention became so sharp they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. I love Barnabas. Uh, he always believed the best about people. So, and now, again, you know, the, the, all, everything that, that, that Saul had learned, you know, before Christ. And, you know, the, for you and I, the same thing. God created you. There's nobody else like you, nobody else like me. I thank God there's only one of you. <laughs> only one. Because, but but that's, that's the truth. But, you know, God, what, what, all that you've gone through throughout your life, God wants to use for his glory. God doesn't want to change you just now because you're, uh, uh, he, he, you are who you are. And, and you use whatever, whatever you have learned, whatever, everything from, from the moment that you can remember to the point where you came to Christ, and now use it for the glory of God. Use it. And that, that was Saul of Tarsus. But uh, just by way of recap, as I close, uh, I just think of the apostle, how he saw the light, the, 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 the light of the world, the light of the glory of Christ, he knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is, is the Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He is not dead. He lives. He suffers with his church, and he fights for his church. He fights for his own. I mean, this is what he knew. He told his story. The Apostle Paul, would, so maybe that, if you don't take anything from this message, you know, next time you get an opportunity, your story, you have a great story. I'm one that I used to think, you know, uh, as a new Christian that I didn't have a really good story because I didn't, uh, I didn't come to Christ while I was passed out with drugs or alcohol or whatever. No, no, no. You're a miracle. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you are a miracle. You have an awesome story. Tell it. Tell it to others. And that's what, that's what Saul of Tarsus did. Uh, he humbled himself. He was led by the hand and God helped him. He brought healing to him, filled him with the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. There was a complete turnaround with him. He had to rethink everything. And maybe, just maybe, you know, for someone that's watching, maybe you or maybe someone that's here, uh, rethinking everything might bring you to the place where God wants you to be, 
What do I mean by that? There's a lot of people today that when, when you talk to them about the Bible, they say, well, there's error in the Bible. And I would say, no, there, there is no error. There's different translations, and you can learn about that. But the Bible says every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And so every word of God is, is pure. Every word of God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. So Saul had to rethink all these things. And if you are maybe one that maybe you say, well, you know, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe that's what has kept you in that place. Because I believe, and the Bible is very clear, what keeps people in their sin and, and not uh, born again, come into that place where God wants you to be is disbelief. If you don't believe the first few words in the Bible, in the beginning, God, if you don't believe those four words, you will struggle with the rest of the book. And so maybe that, just, just maybe that. And, and the, 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 uh, the death that Jesus, uh, the, the death of Jesus on the cross, Saul realized that that was that was to pay for the sins of the world. That was to pay for my sins. It is no longer a system of sacrifice. There's no need for that. And he grew up in a system of sacrifice. Aren't you thankful that, that we don't have that system? You imagine how, how bad this place would be <laughs> coming in here. I'm so thankful we don't have to do that because, because God provided his perfect lamb is perfect the perfect holy lamb of god is jesus and and uh my son actually spoke about it in uh at nine o'clock if you didn't hear that devotion maybe go and, and then check it out but uh that's the truth there's no need for uh, you know sacrifice in fact uh god reprimanded a king it is it is better to obey than to what sacrifice obedience is better than sacrifice you can come and sacrifice you can do this and you can do that and you can but god has done it all he did it all through his son on the cross so i pray for you if you have never trusted jesus and what does that mean to trust him what does it mean to to trust him with your life what does it mean to give your life to him believe that jesus is the christ and you will be born from above god does the rest he does that change that no one can do so I pray that you would do that uh, in your heart of hearts where you are. And then for the rest of us, uh, God, is, God is at work. Is God at work? He is at work. Amen. Right? Right? I mean, it seems like things are falling apart. L listen, believer, things are falling into place. And I'm no different than you. I get bummed out very easily. But, but God, has, God speaks to me to get out of that place just as quickly as you get in that that rut, you need to quickly get out because it's a very dangerous place to be. Very dangerous place to be, even, even for believers. You, the battle belongs to him. I don't have to fight for victory. I fight from victory. Amen? That's, that's what we do. Christians fight from victory. So I thank God for each and every one of you. And I, I, my prayer is that you would continue. Keep praying. Like we say at PGIF, keep praying. Keep praising, keep the faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. And thank you, Lord, for just an awesome reminder of this life that we see in Acts chapter 9, as we saw this morning with uh, Saul of Tarsus, Lord, and uh, how you just radically changed and transformed him and and you are just an amazing God, full of mercy and grace and compassion and forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, that you have called us, myself and my brothers, my sisters, your church. Lord, fill us anew and afresh, in a new and a fresh way with your Holy Spirit, Lord, to overflowing. Lead us by your Holy Spirit or remind us to, to allow you to to take the lead and to and every day, step by step, trust you, the living God who has brought us into this place uh, of koinonia, the fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we thank you so much for loving us first. In Jesus' name, may you be glorified.
And God, as we go from this place in just a few moments, may we go just thanking you for your grace and for your mercy and your forgiveness. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.